The last series that I spoke at was called Wild Times, and I didn't realize it, but the wild times are continuing. And, uh, this particular topic actually still fits in with that theme, but it's a little different. Um, I'm going to approach this by, first of all, beginning with uh, a short lecture about what is politics about. So calling it Politics 0.0, .0 and what it's about is the individual and the group. How we as individuals, being intensely social beings, as human beings, interact with all our fellow beings and how that plays out. Um, I'd like to introduce it by uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, photographs. This is a picture of Amish men building a barn. And uh, you see that they're all in their black colored clothes. Uh, they are all busy. And I would think there's a really jolly spirit that's taking place there. And they're putting up this barn. Uh, you can't see all of them in this picture. There are actually a lot more that you can't see in there. And there are probably something like 30 men working on this barn. And it will get up fairly quickly. And doing that, there is a barn that any one of those men could never have had with that amount of time. And once that barn is finished, they will move and they will go to another family that needs a barn. And then the person whose barn this is will be a part of that crew and they together will raise another barn. And that is why, that's one of the reasons, there are many reasons, but this is one of them, that by working as a group, we multiply our individual efforts enormously. And if you think about the car you drove in here today on, if you wanted to be an independent, independent uh, homesteader, all on your own, you're going to do it all yourself, you will not be able to build a car. It takes a lot of fellow people working together to make a car. So uh, that is the uh, essence of why we are so social. We are, as somebody said, we're like in our relationships to other animals, we're like 90% like chimpanzees, who are fairly social, and 10% like bees, who are really social. They are far more social than chimpanzees. But they do their sociality. What binds them together, what makes them work together, is completely chemical. It is their DNA relatedness to each other. Each of those worker bees is more closely related to her sisters than she is to her mother or father. So um, we human beings have to manage our sociality not like bees, and we manage it with uh, some equipment that nature has endowed us with that's most amazing. So the fundamental problem of politics is how to cooperate, how to maintain harmonious giving and taking so all live more successfully. Now, right off the bat, there are forces that threaten cooperation, that undermine cooperation. Uh, the first one is inequality, which is not quite correct. It's more uh, correct to call it disproportionality, and even that's a kind of clumsy word. But what it amounts to is that we human beings are very tuned up to the fact that if individuals receive benefits that are not proportional to their contributions, then that raises a flag to us. That disturbs us. And it doesn't mean that the benefits have to be equally distributed. We don't get upset, and there have been a lot of experiments done on this, if somebody in a social group works really hard and actually gets a little more of the benefit 
than most of the others. That does not bother people. If somebody works really hard and then says, I'm not taking any more than anybody else is getting, that's worth a great amount of respect, and people like that. But the person who takes proportionally to what he gives does not raise a big flag about you're doing wrong. That's not what you should be doing. So equality is an incorrect way of trying to understand what disturbs us about uh, this business about giving and taking. It's much more about proportionality. So uh, there is a hierarchy in equality, and we human beings are hierarchic creatures. We live in hierarchies. And there is a pecking order in our hierarchy. And it's true for chickens to rhesus monkeys to human beings. And it's also true that the top of the hierarchy takes most of the benefits. And it's mostly enforced by violence in the case of chickens and rhesus monkeys and in the case of human beings very often. And I'll explain how that happens. So I would like to just mention the rhesus monkeys. Uh, these are a species of monkeys that are quite social, and the sociality is all female. The males are kind of hanging around out around the periphery. They're not really part of the intimates of the group of females and their offspring. The females are intensely hierarchical. There is a sort of dominant alpha female, and her children rank really high. And then she has sisters who also rank high. And then it goes down to lower ones and lower to the ones on the bottom who, and what, is that, what does it mean to rank high? It means you have first access to the food. And in fact, the offspring of the alphas are usually fairly healthy and they do very well. Whereas the infant mortality rate of the low ranking females is enormously high. <coughs> Their offspring often die. So that's the hierarchy of rhesus monkeys. Now the hierarchy inequality can be extreme, in which case that's typical of a police state where a ruling elite has got a pretty strong militia or police force that holds everybody else in check. And that was true of a lot of the monarchies that we emerged from in the uh, period between 1000 and 1700 in Europe. Uh, there also are slave states in which there are people in the society who are slaves and they are maintained in slavery by the force and violence of the superiors. So that's one of the forces that threatens cooperation, is to replace it in a way with aggression and violence. Uh, and of course, you can make it work, but you're not going to uh, have the iPhone invented in a society like that. Uh, the second force that undermines uh, cooperation is zero sum and winner take all. Now, let me explain what that's about. Zero sum is an interaction between two parties, A and B, in which A and B always sum to zero. What that means is, if A gains, B has to lose. Or if B gains, A has to lose, because they always have to end up at zero. So if A gets 10, B has to get diminished by minus T, 10. And this is very typical of societies which are built around land and natural resources because there's a finite amount of land. We can't all have it. And if I take more, you will have to take less. So that's the zero sum problem. And it's very important in uh, social relations and it's very important uh, in breaking the zero sum that's what's made modern civilization so possible, is to break that zero sum rule. The other uh, <clears throat> underminer of uh, cooperation is winner take all. Societies in which the winner takes all. 
Uh, a gives 10, B gives 10, the winner gets 20, the loser gets zero. And a lot of our political organization as human beings for the past thousand years and maybe for most of the time since human beings have merged into agriculture and built large cities that were built around agriculture, we probably have been very much in a winner-take-all situation. Uh, so, zero-sum societies principally depend on land and natural resources. Zero-sum and winner-take-all is sustained more by aggression than by cooperation. And there's a very strong sense of you've got to have total victory without compromise because if you try to compromise, you will be overwhelmed and you will have nothing. So I thought we'd take a look at a few of these kinds of societies. Uh, this is a kind of remarkable photograph taken in 1860 in Central Asia. It was actually taken in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan in Central Asia lays in the path of a lot of those republics, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, uh, and all the way over to Persia. And these were territories that were fought over and territories in which Genghis Khan originally made a very big splash. So can you guess who the big man is here? Who, who runs the show here? Uh, well, there he is, of course, and he is the Khan. All of these, all of these guys are Khans. And uh, the, uh, you can see uh, that these look like very difficult characters that you would not want to mess with. And in fact, <laughs> you don't want to mess with them. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to point out. Uh, one of them, which is kind of not terribly important, but th this man is obviously missing a hand or lower arm, and that probably took place in combat. There are, uh, I think I counted something like five or six swords in the picture, and that's not by accident. These are probably uh, close relatives, uh, but not necessarily always close relatives. And uh, you see the children of the Khan, and this eldest child is obviously dressed up rather spectacularly. Uh, but what I'd like you to do is, since most of us know the Bible, is this is not a very different kind of arrangement than was typical of the societies in the Middle East at the time of most of the stories in the Bible that you're familiar with, say the book of Samuel, Kings, these were times when all of these tribes were in constant conflict with one another and raiding one another. So there was not only the problem of keeping everything together in the tribe, there was also the problem of defeating the tribes that wanted to take your land away from you. And also your herds, they would take your herds as well. And if you had a little gold or things hanging around, they would take that too. And you would take it from them. So, uh, you might even think about the fact that um, this fellow here could be David and this could be Saul. As you know, David eventually ended up, he didn't kill Saul because Saul was actually killed in another battle. But I think it's ultimately David and um, Saul would have come to blows because they were fighting over a very valuable resource, which is, uh, first of all, women, and second of all, uh, a military contingent of, of men, men who would be with you. Uh, maybe this is Jonathan over here. Uh, so there's that kind of dynamic that goes on. And also, in the conflict among these, in this kind of social organization, there also is uh, the winner-take-all taking place. If you remember, there's a story of Abigail in the Bible, who is married to a man named Nabal. And this story, of course, was written after David, in the Davidic court, after David had become uh, king. So it's all from David's point of view. But she basically said, I have this terrible husband of all. He's no good. I really would like you. Why don't you come and get me? 
And the Baal is a very big landowner. He has lots of cattle. He's a very rich man. And David and his men basically move in and kill him and take all his possessions, including, most importantly, not only Abigail, but all his other wives. David didn't say, Nabal, look, maybe we can both live in this world together. Maybe you should just, since you have so many wives and I don't have as many as you have, why don't you give me a few of them? And why don't you give me some of those camels and some of those horses? And then we'll both be happy and we'll both be a little more balanced. I won't just be hanging out here with all my gang members trying to knock you off and take over. No. It's winner take all. Uh, how do you maintain order in a winner take all society? Well, these cons in Central Asia use several techniques. You're familiar with crucifixion, but impalement was one of the favorites. And these were all done so that people died in pain and suffering in full view of all, everybody else, and it was to terrorize people. Uh, this, is, this is a slave who was complaining about his conditions. So this was how he was uh, responded to for complaining about his conditions. Now you might say, well, that's a Muslim society and they're brutal people. It's not true. All of these societies are brutal. This is uh, Thomas Armstrong, and the date is uh, 1683. This is a little bit after Isaac Newton was born. So Isaac Newton is alive at this point, doing his uh, science. Uh, we are in the middle of the most difficult and terrible time in English history, which is the period of the English Civil Wars. Uh, they began when the king was the absolute ruler. So the king was the absolute ruler, and uh, the nobles, there were other powerful guys around besides the king. These other powerful guys said, we don't think you should have all the power. So there was a famous uh, accommodation in which uh, a document was signed called the Magna Carta which gave a, a, a kind of parliament. This was sort of the beginnings of parliament. Gave the parliament, you guys are gonna to get to have a say. I'm not gonna do everything. I'm not gonna call all the shots. I'm gonna let you call some of the shots. And uh, that was a difficult and problematic thing. It never completely worked right because people always wanted winner take all. And so it finally came to a head in 1649 when the parliament and their militias got strong enough to overthrow Charles I. And they not only overthrew him, they didn't say, well, why don't you go to France and have a nice retirement? They executed him. And um, the leader of the uprising was a very famous man in British history called, named Oliver Cromwell. And Cromwell and his forces managed to basically overthrow the monarchy and they installed a commonwealth. But the, ro the, the forces that were supporting, well, here's an important point. It's not just about kings and about nobles. It's about a whole network of people that is, whose fates are linked up together, mostly by family, but mostly by various kinds of economic and social connections, land connections, and so all of these people have a stake in one side or the other. This situation is very parallel to what's going on in Syria right now, in which the ruling Assad family, which is much more like the ruling kings and their supporters, are in a desperate fight to hang on because the people who are trying to overthrow them are not going to say, we need to sit down together, like David might have sat down with Nabal and said, I don't need all your wives, I just need a few. Let's be good and try to make something that's more civil. No, everybody's mind in the Syrian crisis, even in the 21st century, because those societies have not made the transition that the Brits made in this really painful period 
in the 17th century, their thinking is still winner take all. If Assad wins, he takes all. And if we win, he gets nothing and we get everything. And a whole lot of people whose livelihoods are all tangled up together with Assad are going to lose their livelihoods. And a whole lot of people that didn't have them before because they were on the outside are going to take them over. So to finish the story about England here, uh, what you're seeing here is the execution of the next phase of the Civil War that took place after Cromwell overthrew Charles I. Then there was a royalist, that's the supporters of the king, and they had a comeback, and they managed to defeat Cromwell. And they restored Charles II in 1658. And after they restored him, um, Cromwell died a natural, had died a natural death. But they, and he had died six years earlier. They exhumed the body of Oliver Cromwell, and they did to it what they're doing to Armstrong here. They bludgeoned it and cut off the head and hung it up on a spike and executed him. He'd been dead for six years. But this was for everybody to see. Um, so Armstrong uh, managed to be on the royalist side for the second time around. And they did not make it. Their second attempt to regain the, the throne failed. And Armstrong was executed. Now you can say, well, he's a rebel, so what do you expect if you're a rebel? Well, this is the way politics was working in England in the 17th century. This is how it worked. And there were body parts that were strung up in various places of political enemies. Political enemies had their heads put on spikes on London Bridge. This was standard even into the late uh, 18th century. So uh, that's where we come from. We come from a heritage that's very strongly winner take all and also has a lot of zero sum because this was mostly before the Industrial Revolution and mostly based on land. So the next thing I would like to do is um, uh, move from that, that's, that's sort of chapter one. Let's take a look at who we are as political animals, as human beings. I don't, mean that, I don't mean that in any undignified way. I think all animals are kind of marvelous and sacred, but we are animals and we're political animals. So first of all, if you look at our brain, or look at our heads, here's our closest relative, the chimpanzee. And if you look at this very enormous brain, the first question one would ask, what is that big brain for? It's not just to make delivery for women extremely difficult. <laughs> but that's the price. That's the price it's worth paying. Um, so there's something in this head that's very important to our sociality, and that's what I would like to explain to you. This head has 100 billion neurons in it and 100 trillion synapses. Each of these synapses is like a little transistor in a computer. So there is enormous computing power in our heads. And not just in our heads, actually throughout our whole nervous system. But it's focused and concentrated in our heads. I, now, obviously the brain is a really complicated thing with enormous numbers of structures. I'm going to boil it down to just two for today. That's the prefrontal cortex, which is this part, that part up there that was so different from the chimpanzee. And this is where a lot of the thoughtful processes of our minds are located. The other is down here in the lower part of the brain, in which is called the limbic system. And there's a very important part of that called the amygdala. So what, the, what I'd like you to take away from this is that thought and emotion are both playing roles in the human brain and they have slightly different centers. 
the limbic system, the emotion system, this is if you this is where fear is, where pleasure is. Uh, the limbic system is effortless. You don't have to work. You don't have to do anything. Just see a snake on the floor and it takes care of itself. It does all the heavy lifting for you. And it's fast. Uh, that amygdala that I told you about is one synapse away from the chemical releasing glands that will release adrenaline into your body when you need to get going to run from some kind of danger. The prefrontal cortex is, is the part that's so unique to human beings, and it's the part that does the thinking. Uh, now, this is very simplified. There's actually some thinking that's done in other parts of the brain as well. The prefrontal cortex is slow, and it takes effort. You have to think about it. I mean, think when you're trying to solve a puzzle. You have to it's work. Whereas the emotional system is just, it, it runs itself. It takes care of itself. So prefrontal cortex is also going to take time. And here's what's really interesting. The size of that prefrontal cortex, if we look at the size for chimpanzees, if we look at the size for orangutans, gorillas, and other primates who are our closest relatives, they all have slightly different sizes. But if you want, if you want to know, if you, you ask, how should it, why is it different? Why are they different sizes? Look to the size of the social group of the animal. And you find that the size is proportional to the number of members in the social group. There's another important thing about that prefrontal cortex is that it is uh, not fully developed until age 20. And I'll say more about that in a minute. So that big brain tells us that, among other things, it has a big role to play about our sociality, about our politics, about the way we remember those who did us a favor, we remember those who were kind to us, we remember those who did not return the favor. We keep track of who's dangerous, who's trustworthy. It takes a lot of computer power to do that. Now here's what's, uh, I think, uh, a, a, this was a very surprising thing to me when I first began studying biology after being primarily uh, a student of physics. And I was surprised, I mean, it, it was something I learned and did not appreciate. The human brain and mind did not evolve for the search for truth but for the search for votes. That means success, not that you're a politician running votes, but we need votes from our fellows of approval, of um, willingness to work with us, uh, pleasure in seeing us, pleasure in wanting to be with us. We do search for votes, not consciously perhaps, but that part of our brain and mind and emotional system is doing that. And we're looking because that depends on our ability to be successful and function in the complex give and take of human society. There's a lot of complex giving and taking going on. Just listen to the healthcare debate at the present time. That is a big debate about <coughs> giving and taking. So, trillions of synapses for complex calculations to, among other things, guard our reputations. This is not a bad thing, but that's what a lot of the activity of our computing brain is about. And to convince others to support us or our team in disputes and conflict. You need a big brain to do that. We are strongly intuitive politicians. You get that for just being human. Chimpanzees are strongly intuitive politicians also. All the social creatures, not bees. Bees don't need any of this because they're hardwired genetically to cooperate. 
They don't, they don't need this. But our cooperation flies through the air. Flies through the air in the speech of other people, in the signs of their actions. We're not just chemical connections, like chemically connected like bees. And we are weakly intuitive science. We're not very good intuitive scientists, but we do, all human beings have a certain amount of intuitive science. So politics is the big deal in a social species like human beings. And politics is very heavily drenched in morality. And um, I tried to indicate that. I was, I was thinking of writing an equal sign, but that's not correct. It's, politics is not equal to morality. So I'm using a symbol. I think Bruce Griffith is a chemist. He might recognize this symbol. It's, it's a kind of symbol to indicate a chemical bond. That there's a kind of strong chemical bond between politics and morals. So let's let's get let's focus now on the morality uh, and just set the politics uh, in second place. We're not giving up on it completely, but I want to focus very strongly now on morality. And morality is uh, balanced between this emotional limbic system and reason in the prefrontal cortex. So morality is played out between these two structures. Oops. And so what I want to do now is bring on stage, uh, I think a fairly uh, good advance in our understanding of moral emotion that's been completed in the last 15 years. So, um, and I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show this moral foundation for three different groups. I'm gonna show them for social conservatives, for libertarians, and for <coughs> liberals. Uh, now, uh, the, the sort of idea here is that each one of these is a kind of foundation it's like a pillar, a pillar holding up the social group. And uh, the social group needs to have these pillars to support it. So the first one is care. We need to have a morality that motivates us to care for one another. And the countervailing uh, force to carry is harming. And that we have a morality that says you, you don't hurt a child because it's funny and you can laugh when the child is crying. That, that is absolutely wrong. So we have an intuitive morality about care and harm. Another one is being these individual agents like we are as human beings, we have a strong sense about wanting to to not have people enslave us, certainly at the extreme. No one wants to be a slave. And at the other extreme, we would like to be free of all constraints. We can do what we want, and other people will just have to lump it. That's the other extreme. But there is something important about liberty. And the countervailing force there is oppression. Well, you can see in the history of politics in Central Asia, this was a big deal. There was very little liberty and there was lots of oppression. Another one, these are all slightly different from one another. Another one is about fairness. Uh, and we're not the only species that does that. I, I think there's just a wonderful experiment that was done with, um, uh, um, I can't remember the kind of monkey. It's a monkey it was done with monkeys. and it, it, the experimenters would put things out that they would sort of hide. It was like a game of hide and seek, or a, a game of uh, go and find the treasure. Treasure hunt, that's right. So the, the monkeys would go out and find the things that the handlers had put out, and they would bring them to them, and the handler would give them a piece of cucumber. And the monkeys were very happy about that. Monkeys like cucumber. And then they would go and find another one and bring it. And then the handler would give a monkey that brought a little treasure, it would give it a grape. 
And that was really great. Except the monkey that was standing next to it with its treasure and got a cucumber, it was not okay. <laughs> In fact, the monkey that got the cucumber threw it on the ground. We can understand that. You can understand that. So we're not the only species that is really sensitive to the issue of fairness. And uh, the countervailing force to that is cheating. Um, we, don't, we don't like insider trading. And yet, that's something that a lot of people would like to do, and in fact, do do. Now we come to these three over here, which are slightly different because they're very strongly oriented towards the group, the preservation of the group. The first is loyalty, loyalty to the group no matter what, and the counterforce to that is betrayal. Uh, then there's authority. I will support the king. I will be a faithful servant of the king. And the countervailing to that is subversion. Uh, that's what Thomas Armstrong got into trouble with. And then there's sanctity. And what we might also think of as purity. And this really has to do with the fact that we are dealing with a lot of pathogens. We get sick. Even people who didn't have modern medicine had some notion about communicable disease. It was inaccurate sometimes, but it wasn't completely inaccurate. And so there is something about um, sanctity. Some things are sacred, and they, the sacred things are also very pure. We have a sense that things that are sacred are pure. They're not dirty. They're not stinky or rotting. Or so, and the countervailing force to sanctity is, is degradation. Now, this, is, these, this, this represents a lot of research done in many parts of the world on lots of different people uh, using a combination of, of surveys and tests that both involve self-identification, where people, identi people say, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this, and they will therefore then be falling into a category of social conservative. The most sacred value of social, con of the social conservative, on average, this isn't going to necessarily apply to everybody, is to preserve the institutions and traditions that sustain a moral community. That is the most uh, precious sacred value. The other thing that's noteworthy about conservatives, uh, social, uh, social conservatives, is that all of these pillars uh, come out to be about of equal strength. Social conservatives evaluate them all, say they're all about the same importance. Um, we'll see that that's not going to be true of uh, libertarians, for example. So we have the same set of uh, moral uh, tendencies. And for the libertarian, the most sacred value is individual liberty. Uh, so this pillar is enormously strong, liberty, oppression. They're not so concerned about care harm. They're a little concerned about fairness and cheating. And again, they're not too concerned about loyalty, authority, and sanctity. So this is their big guy. So let's look at liberals. Well, liberals have care and harm as their main anchor. Um, liberals care very much about not oppressing people. And they also care about helping people who are oppressed. Uh, they're pretty strong on liberty as well, and they're pretty strong on fairness and cheating. But they almost care nothing 
for loyalty, authority, and sanctity. So, uh, that's what we find when we, when we survey large populations of people that divide into liberals, conservatives, and libertarians. Um, let's go back now to reason versus emotion. And uh, this is a very important lesson, I think. Uh, Plato, the philosopher Plato, really felt that reason should, he knew that it wasn't controlling the passions, that is the emotions, but it should. The emotions shouldn't just be running around doing their thing. They should be subject to reason. And uh, St. Augustine uh, famously felt that as well, but he said the ability that we had to control the passions was lost with Adam's sin. Now, in the 18th century, the uh, Scottish philosopher David Hume uh, turned this completely around. He said, Plato is not right about this. It's just not the way things are. David said, David Hume said, reason is the servant of the passions. The emotions are running the show. And I just want to bring in Thomas Jefferson because he actually weighed in on this. He had a dual model. He said, well, he was trying to bring them together. He said, emotion and reason both have roles to play. So maybe they're, they're co-rulers. But all the experiments that have been done in the past 20 or 30 years in social psychology basically say Plato is mostly wrong, Hume was mostly right, and the Jefferson dual model is showing only the first early signs of emergence in modern humans, if it's even present at all. So, emotion <coughs> rules. The prefrontal cortex, why are you there if the limbic system, which is the seat of emotion, is running the show? Very important for it to be there. And let's see why it's there. The prefrontal cortex, or the thoughtful parts of the mind and brain, really we need, we need to think of them in the way we think about the president and the press secretary, or even the president of a corporation and the head of the, the, the press relations. The press secretary, we need to think about the rational parts of the brain and mind, with that, most of that prefrontal cortex, all the work it's doing, is like the work of the press secretary serving the emotional boss. But the emotion is like the president, the boss. So that rational mind never quite knows exactly what, what the boss is going to have on his plate this day. So he's always prepared to defend it. And it's up to that rational press secretary to justify explain, rationalize the thing that has already been pre-decided by the emotions. So I want to illustrate it now. <laughs> um, these were some psychological tests, questions, that were specifically constructed so they did not violate the harm, care, moral pillar. Uh, eat the family dog for dinner. What that's about was a, a test where you say the family dog was hit by a car and killed. There's nothing we can do about that. But why don't we cook him and eat him for dinner? It's not going to hurt anybody. It's not going to hurt the dog. It's not going to hurt anyone. Is that a moral thing to do? Can you cook your dog and eat it for dinner if it was hit by a car and it's dead? <laughs> All of these depend very strongly on what part of the world you live in. Um, now the next one I want to mention. Now what, what is this getting at? Eat the family dog for dinner is obviously getting 
somewhere near <clears throat> loyalty a bit and also purity and sanctity. Uh, Efficiency. Efficiency. You don't have to waste your money to buy dinner. Oh, well, no, but that's not a moral emotion. Okay. I'm trying to find what... I'm rational. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say more about, about how these come out when people actually study them. But they've been studied among lots of different cultures. And there is a variation in the response, depending on whether the culture is very traditional or whether it's very modern and developed. So the next two I want to talk about are Mark and Julie. Uh, um, in quantum information theory, which is always about people transmitting messages and whether they can trans teleport them without uh, sending anything, all kinds of exotic quantum mechanics. The people are always called Bob and Alice. So, but I guess the people in, since I work in both areas, I thought, well, this, this is Bob and Alice, but uh, no, the social psychologists call them Mark and Julie. So Mark and Julie are brother and sister. They're together on a vacation. And they decide it might be uh, kind of special to make love together. Now, Julie is on birth control, and Mark uses a condom. They're not going to hurt anybody that way. There's no danger of pregnancy. Um, and they decide they're going to keep it a secret. It would be a special thing just between them. So is this morally permissible? Is it okay for them to do that? What do you think? I'm not going to press you to answer, <laughs> but you can, you can think about it. Um, um. There's no right way to do a wrong thing. Uh, oops. So the next one is there's a lady who has a flag and it's so worn out she hasn't you know, been using it as a flag. And so she decides to use it as a rag and clean her toilet with it. Is that okay to do? Is that morally permissible? Uh, now this is a real event here. This isn't a made up story by some uh, social psychologists. Uh, can you put a crucifix in urine and display it in an art show? Is that immoral? And the last one here uh, is like the easiest of all of these. Can you make fun of the Pope on television? Can you make fun of the president on television? Can you make fun of the imam on television? Can you make fun of the patriarch on television? In many countries, you cannot do that. It would be considered terribly wrong to make fun of the imam. But in the developed world, uh, that's, that's often very permissible. We seem to be able to do that. Um, so I just want to say something about uh, why these are all interesting. Because uh, none of these violate the harm, care, pillar that is very fundamental to liberals. They don't violate it. And the other thing I want to talk about is uh, how the level of education of people affects how they respond. Um, the more education you have, the more reasons you can find to support your view that, for example, Mark and Julie just cannot do this. It is just wrong. And the more, and if you're a graduate student and have a PhD, you'll have even more reasons to back up your, your uh, uh, belief. And some of them will be, uh, I, I actually gave this test to a couple of people, and one of them said, I don't see anything wrong with that. So um, the, the way people respond uh, will always have a reason. If you, uh, especially educated people, if you give these tests to educated people and ask them why 
they're either immoral or, or, or moral, you will get a very definite explanation of why. Now, if you go into uh, a working class McDonald's, which uh, uh, one of the people behind this test, Jonathan Haidt, spent a lot of time doing as a graduate student, and you ask people, uh, can you eat the family dog for dinner? It's not hurting anybody. <coughs> they look, look at you. And they say, uh, I don't know what planet you're from, buddy, but if you don't know you shouldn't do that, I can't help you. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, oops. so the, the rational press secretary is very much operative. And you don't have to be highly educated to have a rational press secretary. But the important thing is, the emotion has already decided your position. And what you're giving as the reason is almost not to the point. And if you are giving this as a reason to somebody who came out on the other side, for example, whether you can make fun of the Pope on television, and somebody says, well, I don't see anything wrong with that, and you say, you know, it's so disrespectful. You're not going to convince them with your, your reasons. Because the reason is not where it came from. The reason is what the press secretary is dancing around trying to offer people for a decision that was already made in the emotional system. So, um, you can see that we're trying, what I'm trying to do here is put in place some things that we can use to work with. Uh, and the next thing I want to talk about is, are there genetic differences between liberals and conservatives? And the answer is yes, because there are genetic differences on all levels of human beings. Um, so I'm, and lots of studies that were done um, testing the, first of all, you know something about the genetic makeup of the individual, and then you also know their response to the various, these various kinds of tests. And the tests are, have to be really skillfully done um, because people are dishonest when you actually ask them questions about psychology or politics. They don't tell the truth. So you have to have a test. They have a very sophisticated test that's based on reaction time to words flashing on a screen. And when you delay on the reaction time, you show a bias that you would not show if somebody just asked you, are you biased against that or not? And you would say, no, I'm not biased. But when you do a test that involves responding to pictures, uh, that delay indicates the brain is working, it has been attracted to the fact that this is uh, a situation or an image that's di wanting a different response than if you were favorably disposed towards it. So, um, <coughs> When these are all tallied up, there are genetic differences, and they can be summarized in two basic principles. Two basic principles. Sensitivity to threat, and curiosity and desire for new experiences. Do you know which one is typical of liberals and which one is typical of conservatives? This is not a trick question. I'd say the first one is conservative. That's right. Conservatives are definitely sensitive to threat. And liberals are, by and large, these are, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of things. But if you wanted to just sum it up in one thing that really pokes up and sticks out, the thing that pokes up and sticks out for conservatives is a sensitivity to threat. And I think that makes sense because they probably are sensitive to personal threat, but they also are sensitive to threat to the, the, the social group. 
They don't want the group to fall apart. They don't want the group to be hurt. Because, in a sense, their destiny is tied to the group, too. And uh, they depend on the group for protection and so on. So it's not, it's not so surprising. Uh, and as far as liberals being definitely up for curiosity and desire for new experiences, this makes sense given the dynamic nature of life, that nothing stays the same. And that's true of human life. And it's particularly true in this day and age, in the 21st century, when things move fast. We, we, society is not constant. The society you saw on the screen of Central Asian governance, which actually was very similar to King David's society in ancient Israel. Between 1860 and King David, the, you can find enormous similarities. But between 1860 and today, the exponential curve is rising. Things have moved much more quickly. And they call to our attention one of the fundamental aspects of life. It's dynamic. It's not changing. It's not the same. Things are changing. New things are coming into being, and old are passing away. And so uh, it's not surprising that uh, nature would uh, uh, evolve a capacity to deal with the fact that things change quickly. So if you have curiosity and desire for new experiences, then maybe you'll be prepared for the new thing that's coming. So I just wanted to say something more about genetics and genes. Um, it's not true that basically you're controlled by your genes or you're made by your genes. That's a very inaccurate way to understand it. The initial layout, uh, think of it like the opening chapter of the book has been established by your genetic endowment that you got from your parents and they got from their ancestors, and so on. So there is um, a neural network that bears on all of our sensitivities, our emotional sensitivities and our moral sensitivities, that has an initial setting that we got from our parents. Some of us are going to be a little more uh, adventurous, some people are going to be uh, tall. All of these characteristics are all part of our initial endowment. But particularly for the neural network, that's the mind, the brain, the emotional system, we come in, and I'm trying to show here that we start with, we start with DNA. And DNA has a region where a gene, a certain gene exists. And those genes are then all together in this long loop of DNA. And what those genes do is to tell how to hook these neurons up in the brain. It even has the prescription of how to make the neuron as well as hook it up. Uh, and I've tried to indicate, I mean, there, there really aren't any dials in there, but I've tried to indicate that there's always a little difference in the various settings for fear and pleasure and uh, uh, alertness, uh, laziness. All, all of these things have little settings and we all have little different settings of our dials when we first are born, which came from our genetic legacy through our parents. But as we grow, this network is going to develop. And I think you all know that, for example, for the baby in the first two years of life, it's a huge thing much of that baby's neural network in its brain is going to get rewired and a lot of connections are going to be chopped off. Why? Because we have, first of all, for evolutionary history, we have something like uh, 40 million years for primates and for human beings, maybe a million years. There's, there, it's not clear what kind of environment this baby is going to be in. So the it's Mother Nature has this flexibility. So when you're born, you've got this basic equipment, but it needs to be tuned up. And so it starts to get tuned up by the very specific environment in which the baby finds itself. 
And remember that prefrontal cortex is not fully formed till the early 20s. So a lot of this tuning of these settings is taking place as you grow as a young person and as a young adult. So um, your life experience is going to change some of these dials. But some of them, it's not going to change because they are very important and they stay fixed. They don't need to be flexible. But the ones that are useful in being flexible will change and so the brain and emotional system are going to get rewired by life experience and learning. Okay, so what I've laid out here is um, what we bring to the whole world of politics as human beings, where we came from, our previous ancestors and how they behaved, the kinds of things that they bequeathed us, uh, the modern prevalence of winner take all, we can definitely owe to our ancestors, and zero sum, uh, uh, the legacy of zero sum is also still very much with us in many ways. So I just thought I would mention some modern factors, but you're really all aware of these, so I'm almost not really telling you anything you don't know. We're in a wild time of rapid change. There's globalization, urbanization, climate and ecology under huge uh, upheavals, the rainforest disappearing, climate changing, and familiar beliefs that you, that our parents and grandparents could probably expect to live out their life with because they wouldn't change till after they died. Familiar beliefs can be overturned within a lifetime. So, um, what I'm going to ask you to do is to sort of hang on to the things I've <coughs> described to you. And uh, what I'm going to try to do is, is just sort of set the stage for the next time we get together. We have a gridlock of conflicting group interests. And we have this equipment that I've described to you. A strong sense about politics being moral. We have a strong sense of uh, emotional commitments that are not rational and that you can't really argue very well. What do we do with this equipment? Well, the standard thing that was done, as you just saw in England, and has been going on forever, what our ancestors have given us is not very helpful for the present. Because when you hit these impossible conflicts of self-interest between two different groups, the way nature has solved this problem in human beings is to fight it out. And the winner then prevails. And we did that in America in a civil war. It is going on right now in Syria. And what I was explaining to you was a most terrible time of English history, which the British are so lucky to be past. Civil war in the modern world is not an option, except for uh, someone who's uh, mad. Well, the other thing that people did was immigrate. When they could not make a compromise, they could not deal with the monarchy in England, for example, the Puritans, who were uh, allied with Oliver Cromwell, said, we just got to get out of here. Let's leave. And they came to America. That's when the Puritans came to America, was during this British Civil War. And we had many other groups, including the Amish men that I showed you, that came out of civil wars in Europe to leave them and to go to a country where they would not be war. Well, immigration is not feasible anymore because the society is huge and the world is filled up. All the places you can go to are already occupied. So there is really only one alternative. And that's to evolve beyond the winner-take-all mentality. 
we need to learn the art of compromise. So I'm going to leave with just a question here. Uh, and I thought we'd have a discussion period. But I want to ask you uh, to, save, to save the discussion that you are perfectly invited to bring to the next lecture when we talk about how we can come together if what you want to talk about is Republicans and Democrats and who's responsible and all of that. Um, I'm sure you have some things to say about that, but I'd like to ask you to hold that for next time. That will be the appropriate time for it. But I would like to spend this discussion time directed to this question. Why do we debate with one another across partisan lines when it is demonstrably without any mind-changing effect? It's a dog and pony show. Well, um, so, um, so I have a couple of answers to this. I don't mean to step in, and I, and I hope you have better answers than I do, because I'm not terribly happy with one. But one of them is that this is animal behavior analogous to bird calls. Now, before you think of this is crazy, what are you talking about? Most animals are communicating when they make sounds that we don't understand and we kind of ignore and don't pay any attention to. But when you hear chickens walking around the yard clucking or cackling <coughs> or making another sound, those are all coded and the chickens understand what they're saying. And that's true of birds. The call may mean there's a predator around or the call, we, we, don't complete, we haven't completely parsed bird language. But all of those animals are constantly advertising their pre presence, they're saying, here I am, I'm calling like a chickadee. Are you a chickadee? Do you see me? Are we okay? Is there any predator around? Chickadee, 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 chickadee. Uh, and this is also true of uh, mammals. Deer have a particular warning call that they use, and they also have some other calls as well. It is not so far-fetched to think that deep in that emotional system that we inherited, there is a pressure to advertise who we are uh, in the hope that it will elicit a response from a fellow bird. In other words, we're not really talking to anybody whose mind we're trying to change. We're only talking to our fellows. We're only talking to the people who are on the same page we are. And of course, that's exactly what it comes out like. So, uh, being, being the physicist, I go for the wild, far out explanations very often. But this is animal behavior analogous to bird calls. Another slightly more positive thought is that this is the early appearance of Jeffersonian rationality. That is, we barely can do it. We can hardly do it. But we are trying to reason. We're trying to explain why some policy really has some bad consequences. And many policies do have bad consequences. Um, and the person that we're talking to has a very strong commitment to that policy because it also solves another problem that's very important, which I, trying to attack this, don't appreciate that that would be undermined. So th it's a multidimensional thing. That is, politics is mostly about part truths. The part that's important to us that leaves out the part that has its Achilles heel, its downfall, the things about it that maybe are not so good, that part gets left out. So. Uh, in working out a solution to a problem, it's messy, and you make mistakes. So maybe what this is all about is the very early appearance of Jeffersonian rationality, that we really are trying to be rational. When people are debating across the political divide, they really do want to see if there can't be some understanding. But we've got that big elephant of the emotional system that's already got all the mind made up. It's not listening for that sort of thing. 
it wants to, it's saying, Mr. Press Secretary, don't pay attention to that. You got to defend my emotional commitment. You're my press secretary. Don't start thinking on your own. So uh, those are my thoughts. So we'll go ahead and turn this over to a discussion now, and you can tell me what your thoughts are about why we do something that doesn't work. Or, or anything else, except we're not going to do Republican-Democrat politics today. I think, yes. I think it's self-interest, power, It's fundamental that rival groups have self-interest. If I spent my life in the coal industry and I built up a business, green fuel is a threat to me. If I'm a newcomer and I really want to get into uh, solar power, hey, it's great for me. But you've got to take into consideration that somebody whose life was spent on something else is not going to be happy about it. So uh, I think it's too simple to say it's all about greed. In fact, the simplest thing is to say we're all greedy. We all want our way. We all have our self-interest. Yes? Doesn't a lot of it go back to Two things, on genetic coding and on uh, try to, uh, Let me just suggest to everybody to try to speak as loudly as you can. Doesn't it go back to two things, uh, genetic coding and environment? Because the environment develops my final genetic coding. And I'm conservative or I'm liberal, depending on how I was taught. Yes, but that, uh, that learning experience can move things around. Y yes. Yeah. But I learned through the environment. Yes. Yeah. I, I think, Ray, maybe what you're saying at your age, you're, you're who you are and that's what it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. And also, uh, one of the things we don't understand or don't appreciate is how important time is in politics. The movement of time. If you had a society like, like, that, like that Central Asian ruling family. Take a snapshot in time and, and freeze it. Nobody's going to die. Nobody's going to be born. Now, they have probably jockeyed for position, but maybe they mostly resolved it by then. Well, let them jockey a little more. It's like chickens. When you first bring chickens together, they will jockey around until they get a pecking order. And once the pecking order is established, it's stable and they're not beating up on each other and causing a ruckus. It's very peaceful. So maybe they've reached that point where it's peaceful. But nobody's going to be born and nobody's going to die. And one other thing, nobody's going to immigrate. Nobody new is going to come into the picture. So if you freeze this society in time, you're not going to have much of a politics. There's not going to be any politics to speak of. The politics comes from the bubbling up of new young people who didn't get to be part of the previous coalitions that were set up. What's happening in Syria is the uprush of this high birth rate of new people who are not part of the old arrangements, who didn't get a sweet deal to be part of this company or that company or be in this ministry or that ministry because your cousin was the minister. There's only so many of those jobs to go around. There's not enough. And so you're left out. So bubbling up birth is a big bubbling up that moves politics. And death, the old great patriarch, King David, finally had to die. Off. So death is removing political forces and birth is pumping, pumping in new political forces. And in addition, immigration is pouring in. So, or maybe in some cases, the country's emptying out. That's, that could also happen. So time, the dynamic, the dynamic of life is a very big part of politics. If, if we were static, if we were living in heaven, 
where nothing changes. There's no politics. Maybe that's the whole idea of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, if there are two answers I can see, and everybody's mind is set, it doesn't make sense to talk about it, but if there are multiple opinions and you're trying to build coalitions against the other side, then you would be discussing. You would be... You would have, you would have discussions. You would yeah. Advocate. Could you say the same thing just a little louder? I don't think most people heard you. Just, oh. just say it a little louder. Uh, with, if, in any, if, in any uh, issue, there were multiple opinions and you were trying to build coalitions, you would, of course, want to discuss or bring out uh, allies, make allies, make right. alliances. That would be a lot of discussion. Definitely. That's, that's a very good point, that it's not just one force against another force. There are multiple forces, and they may not line up the same on, on both sides. That's the coalitional aspect. That's a good point. Thank you. Yes? Going back to your um, slide that dealt with the um, eating the family dog, all of those items were totally acceptable in different social societies, human societies. And that is um, the baggage that, that I think wise people all over the human spectrum call the the lack of education, the lack of a reasonable examination of the false and mistaken, misleading, alienating beliefs that so many cultures bring to this effort to get along. And all of the items, just like they represent well, the diversity among common sense, uh, well, the diversity that, that's brought to the table. Common sense would look at each one of those and say these are social constructs, moralities that come with a given belief system. And if they're constructs of a culture, then they really need to be examined as to their value as far as the whole of humanity, and then eliminate it accordingly if they're really... Tell it to the emotional system. <laughs> uh, that's, that's exactly what I think the gentleman earlier talked about their environment. Our indoctrination is encumbering us in our... Their environment is rapidly changing before their eyes. Well, they're in us. Ours, our environment and our education as we approach all, all over the world people have cell phones all over the world people are tuned in to the, the, the change dramatic change can't be hidden away from uh, cultures even as much as some governments yeah it largely them. is unfortunately um, is there another question a thought yeah. oh did you yeah, okay. um, I think I think the question you posed for us was uh, given uh, given our proclivity to uh, talk to those who agree with us to send the, the chickadee <coughs> talks to the chickadee and the sparrow to the sparrow. Um, why do we continue to try to argue across partisan lines? I think that we, care, we, especially in the West, carry the legacy of the age of reason when a great deal of stock was put in the hope that we could all come together and sort out the best thing to do for the community. Uh, you see that in the behavior of, of, of our founding, uh, founding fathers. Um, 
they were they were exploring. They didn't. Nobody told them this was how you do it, but they were trying to find an alternative to living under kings uh, and simply saying yes, sir, and never questioning your place in life. They were trying to find a way to make a common place in life. Uh, so we put a great deal of stock in. We can all work it out together. What you have told us about the uh, our genetic uh, coding, which inclines us toward one way of thinking or another, uh, is a relatively new discovery. A very, very new discovery. And um, it's so fundamental to how that explains a lot of what you experience it, in the so, dialogue. Yeah, it, it really it really challenges mm -hmm. our our foundational assumptions. Okay, I would just like to say along with that, uh, our history books and stuff do not give the whole picture. It's whoever the historian that writes the books. And during our revelation river of uh, early years during the starting of this country, there was a lot of discontent and different sides and different angles. And it wasn't just all everybody coming together and agreeing on it. I mean, it, how many years did it take before we had our Constitution? You know, and so I think they had the fractions and they had their own agendas, even then. It's just that what we see in our history books aren't necessarily exactly how things took part, like the American Indian situation and what they went through, so. Well, that's true, think, that's yeah. true worldwide, that the reigning, yeah. the reigning uh, establishment in the country writes mm -hmm. the books once. And it's less so, I think, in the Western democracies, but there's still, I mean, certainly, I don't know, I can't speak for uh, the Dutch or the Swiss or even the Brits, but uh, American textbooks are, you know, are fairly basically bland. It, it, one of the things is to keep them bland. and mm -hmm. It's a hard task. It's a hard task because uh, everybody has the, a vote to object, so to speak, and um, it's very hard to get everybody on the same page. Somebody described it like herding cats. Did you have a question? Um, okay, if you discount for a second uh, statistical anomalies, selection bias, dissonance, all of that, wouldn't the motivating factor for trying to, as you said, talk to a wall, uh, trying to convince someone emotionally opposed, uh, wouldn't it really boil down to acceptance, the desire for acceptance as an overriding motivator? Like if you look at game theory, uh, competitive uh, Nash's equilibrium, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't that kind of be the motivation there to for if you and I were diametrically opposed, but we still tried to convince each other, right. wouldn't it be to try to ultimately win acceptance? Uh, whether um, that's genetically I, or I think um, uh, what he's suggesting is that when you get into this kind of gridlock, instead of going, uh, please correct me if this is, uh, that instead of going to force of arms, you try to wear each other down rhetorically. Uh, but I think, uh, and I'm going to talk about more about this the next time on December 1st, the way using game theory as a, uh, as a entry point or as a way to uh, tackle this problem, what's really called for is imagination to change the payoff matrix imagination to re to see the problem in a different light and uh, then things may look different to the parties 
Um, and I, I think just having a healthy dose of we are carrying this, we, we carried the legacy of war through the 20th century. And so far we've managed to stay away from it, uh, a world war. <clears throat> But little wars, which uh, are not big enough to really scare us or hurt us, we still dabble around in. But um, I think that the, the, uh, the realities of the present can, uh, what's that word they use? Concentrate the mind, can concentrate the mind of uh, the uh, disagreement. And one healthy thing we, we should all definitely have <coughs> is that we're living with this uh, monkey on our back, with this legacy, this winner-take-all legacy. If the Democrats were ever to give in on the health bill the Republicans would take it all away completely. They would completely be devastated and lost. Or on the other side, if the Democrats get this through and make it work, the country is screwed, the country will be terrible, you would never want to live here, it'll be a terrible country. It's, it's just the winner take all, rather than to say, how do we solve problems one by one, <coughs> one by one. Uh, so we still live with that winner take all, Legacy. If I understood you correctly earlier, uh, were you saying that the Alawites, Syrians, uh, that regime, in your opinion, wouldn't accept an alternative other than all or So far they haven't. So far I haven't seen any give on either side. Each side still seems to, is, is firmly committed to uh, there's no solution to this but total victory. What about their history in Lebanon? They had to bloody themselves for 15 years? 25. <laughs> was it 25 years? Well, the worst part of that Lebanese Civil War, I think, was the last 10 or 15 years. And uh, if you have little kids growing up, where all the adults are basically shooting at each other and bombs are exploding all the time and your relatives are dying, you may have a different idea about the glory of defending your rights and going to war. And, and after these convulsions in which all this blood is spilled because it's winner take all, a new generation comes up that doesn't want to live that way. But of course, if it doesn't have any experience, then maybe it could fall back and be fall uh, pray to the old uh, idea. But the Syrian civil war is just a tragedy. It's, and it's a tragedy in people's heads. It's a tragedy of the emotional system and the brain that can't get out of this hole. And, and you mentioned game theory. That's a very good way to describe the dynamic. So the way to get out of that is to change the nature of the game in a way that the parties can see and understand. Perpetual brainstorm. Well, no, uh, just change the dynamic. Uh, it, it really requires imagination. One of our greatest uh, needs is imagination. Imagine something different. Imagine that this conflict could be seen in a different way, where the needs of each side could be met. Especially this liberal conservative divide in America. There's more similar, there's more common ground than we, we, we understand, than we accept, than we pay attention to. There's huge amounts of common ground between the two parties. Yes? Um, how does it come tomorrow? How do they come tomorrow? Well, the Irish were a big part of this English Civil War. Um, and basically, they lost when uh, the Catholics lost when the uh, parliamentarians won. And so, and actually Catholics were, had their property disappropriated. So when I say that there is an important... I mean in more recent times with the IRA. Well, we had, we had 20 years of 
I mean, we had continuing bombings and, and, and agitation until finally, it's like a fire that you're trying to put out. And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and finally it kind of gets under control. Um, people get tired of living that way. That's the other thing that is important is time. Time moves. Things change. A generation comes to be that doesn't want to live that way. <clears throat> the Hatfields and McCoys have a reunion. Nowadays? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I have kind of a question. Yes. That's for everyone. Uh, David, you spoke of the importance of imagination. And you also believe in the importance of the information, the new knowledge, the, <clears throat> these kinds of uh, scientific studies, uh, human psychology, and biological origin of some of our attitudes and predispositions or behaviors. And, and the biggie, of course, uh, fact that we come now to see that a lot of our uh, stances, our political positions, are rationalized, not with good reasons, but as, um, I guess, uh, uh, straws that we search for or grasp at uh, to sort of keep that belief afloat because we already uh, and for some psychological reasons, need to have it. Well, what if we took the knowledge here that we've gotten today and kind of spread it around? And Because I find it shocking and embarrassing. I mean, I've done all these things for years. But it seems to me that based on what we know, what you've given to us, in Congress we see people asking each other the wrong questions. They're not debating the right issues. Instead of saying, I think you're wrong for these reasons. We, we should be asking each other, could you please give a rational uh, defense for what you believe? Um, and then ask, well, is that really the reason why you believe this? And if it is, if your belief is based on this reason you're giving us, then what would it take in general to change your mind? If a belief is based on evidence, then what evidence could you describe for us which, if it were true, would cause you to change your mind? And, and that kind of question may stop everyone in their tracks, perhaps. Well, it could also just make the press secretaries work harder. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um. but, but, but I think, um, I, I, I've never seen a try. I, I really have never seen this try. If, if you defend your belief by reference to evidence, and then I ask you, well, if this is the evidence, then what other <coughs> hypothetical evidence would lead you to change your mind? And you can't supply a hypothesis or a hypothetical situation in which you have a different belief. Then you, then you are frankly admitting that this is not the support for your belief. Because after all, uh, what is not built upon evidence can't be destroyed by counter but the emotion doesn't even care about evidence. It just cares about winning. <laughs> well, of course, then, then what is the value of having any of this knowledge or information if it can't Well, that's where I thought that maybe, maybe the Jeffersonian model is making a little inroad, that it's starting to get a little bit of a foothold, that, in fact, it does count, that, that the logic of your position does have some uh, <laughs> importance. And the, validity of the facts and so on. But I think a much more promising route is um, uh, the desire to not want to fight, the desire to want to, to uh, uh, bring forward those common things that say in, in America, uh, both parties actually agree pretty strongly on. Let's work on those things. But we're getting ahead of the cart, ahead of the horse here. Uh, I want to save that for next week. I hope you'll come back next week. Um, yes? When you talked about the press secretary, this particular press secretary that we have today, you can watch him and you can tell whether he believes what he's saying or not. <laughs> if his lips are red and he doesn't believe what he's saying. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. He's forced to say, you know, um, one aspect, too, of uh, 
compromise and negotiation that we really haven't brought out is that in today's political world, so much of compromise, you know, when two political factions come together, we watch it on the news, we all think that they're trying to come to some goal that has the common good as its uh, major theme. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Most of the time it's, okay, behind closed doors, what are you gonna do for me and I'll, what can I do for you? That's what it's really about. Well, do you think that's new? <laughs> well, but <laughs> out of just, that, it's just more known about today than it used to be yeah, because but, of communications. Lincoln's adversaries got nominated for the U.S. Senate by trading off postmasterships. <laughs> so. But people didn't have iPhones back then, you know, <laughs> or CNN. Oh. Well, I think uh, it's time for refreshments. So thank you, and we will hopefully. Appear in